In the last few lectures, we've talked a little bit about ideals and rings. In particular, we've seen that the kernel of a ring homomorphism is an ideal, and we've stated and proved the isomorphism theorem theorems for rings. Uh, in particular, we proved the first isomorphism theorem, and we stated the other few and gave some hints about how the proofs go. So in this lecture, we're going to talk much more about ideals, and uh, we'll continue this discussion into the next lecture. So this is a point of the course where I'm going through dominant foot in a lot more detail than I usually do, because this is a really important uh, foundational section. If you have a solid understanding of properties of ideals, you'll be able to apply these ideas uh, in this material that comes later. So let's begin this lecture by just reviewing the definition of ideals that comes from section 7.3 of dominant foot. So R is a ring, I is a subset, little r is an element of R. We have R times I is the set of all things of the form this little r times a, where a goes through the elements of i. i times r, same thing, uh, but on the other side. So everything of the form a, which is some element of i, times this fixed r. And i is a left ideal if it's an additive subgroup of r, and it also is closed under left multiplication by elements in r. So for all r in the ring, alpha in i, r times alpha is back in i. That is, with this notation above, Ri is a subset of i for all elements of the ring. That's what a left ideal is. A right ideal is similar, additive subgroup. And now, instead of being closed under left multiplication by elements in the ring, you must be closed by right multiplication by elements in the ring. So for all r in the ring, alpha in the ideal, uh, alpha times r, now this little r is on the right, lands back in i. That is. I times R is a subset of I for all elements of the ring. And the cases that we'll be most interested in uh, for most of this um, course and also 206B is when I is an ideal or a two-sided ideal, meaning that it's both a left ideal and a right ideal. So if R is commutative, if you just compare the elements in R times I and I times R, you see that these are the same sets. So you're a left ideal if and only if you're a right ideal, if and only if you're a two-sided ideal. In a non-commutative ring, you really have to can think about left ideals and right ideals separately. There's something to check uh, for each one. So I want to start by finishing up by going back and talking about some material from section 7.3, some examples of ideals in matrix rings. So first, I'll do one example. And the next example, I'll give you uh, a situation where you have a left ideal that really is not a right ideal. So to emphasize this point about how you have to work a little harder when R is not commutative. Okay, so I want to start with this example, which is example six on page 244. Take N at least two, consider the ring of N by N matrices with entries in R. So R can be commutative, and this is still going to be a non-commutative ring. So let's say that J is some ideal of R, and let's say MNJ is the subset of MNR consisting of all N by N matrices with entries in J. The first thing that I claim is that MNJ is an ideal of MNR. And you can prove this directly from the definition of an ideal. You can check that MNJ is closed under addition. If you think about how addition works, uh, in for matrices, you're adding the entries of two matrices component-wise. So the reason that this is an additive subgroup is the same reason that J is an additive subgroup of R. Now we have to check that M and J is closed under left multiplication by elements in M and R. And you can check that that's true by looking at uh, what are the entries of a product of two matrices. So you go across a row, down a column, and we're going to get every matrix entry will be a sum of a bunch of things that'll be 
something in R times something in J. And because J is an ideal, that's going to land back in J. Same thing, we'll show you that it's closed under right multiplication by elements of R, which will tell you that MNJ really is an ideal of MNR. OK, but there's another way to think about this. How do we know that MNJ is an ideal of R? Well, it is the kernel of a ring homomorphism. Which ring homomorphism? The one that comes from reducing each entry modulo j. So what does that mean? We have this natural projection of R onto R mod j. And we can apply this to each entry of a matrix in MNR. And this is a ring homomorphism. If you apply this to every entry in uh, a matrix in MNR, then you're going to get a bunch of matrix entries that are all in R mod J. So you get a map from MNR to MN R mod J. And what is the kernel of that map? Well, it'll be all of the n by n matri matrices where every entry is in the kernel of this natural projection map. And we know that the kernel of pi is j. So that exactly is giving us this definition of mnj. So in this example, I just want to emphasize that there are two ways to show that this is an ideal. One of them is faster, but it's a little more work to, I think, think of the right uh, ring homomorphism to consider. OK, so I'll pause and erase. And then I'll say a little more about this example. And then I'll give you a different example of a left ideal in a matrix ring that is not a right ideal. We have seen that if j is an ideal of R, then mnj is a two-sided ideal of mnr. So let's pick a particular example. Let's say R is z. What do the ideals of z look like? We know that they all look like nz for some positive integer n, or we also have the trivial ideal. So what does this say? This says, for example, m 3 2 z the ring of 3 by 3 matrices, uh, where all of the entries are even, is an ideal of m 3 z OK, so I should be a little careful about, I said the ring of all 3 by 3 matrices with even entries. This is where you're using the dummet and foot definition of ring, where your ring doesn't have to have an identity, because there's clearly no multiplicative identity here. All right, so if we're talking about ideals and matrix rings, what other two-sided ideals are there? And exercise 21 of section 7.3, this is a good one that you should do, says that that's it, that every two-sided ideal of MNR is equal to MNJ for some ideal J in R. The next example I want to talk about is uh, a good one to know. It's an example of a left ideal that is not a right ideal. So we already know that if we're going to find an example like this, it has to come from a non-commutative ring. So let's say that R is a commutative ring with identity, one not equal to 0, and n is at least 2. So you can think about how to modify this example uh, when you drop the assumption that R is commutative or when you drop the assumption that your ring has a 1. But let's stick to this easier case. And let's define Lj to be the set of all n by n matrices that have zeros everywhere, except in column j, where they can have any entries. Let's show that this is a left ideal of uh, MNR. So it's clearly an additive subgroup, right? If you add two matrices that have zeros in all the columns except column J, you get another matrix that has zeros in all the columns except column J. Inverses, you just take the additive inverse of each one of these entries. OK, so that's easy to check. So the thing is to check that LJ is closed under left multiplication by elements of MNR. So let's pick an arbitrary element T in MNR and an ar arbitrary element A in LJ. So I'm going to write A as 0, 0, 0. These are column vectors. The column vector V that can be anything, 0, 0, 0, 0. And we can see easily that T times A has zeros in columns I for all I not equal to J. And why is that? Well, 
how do you multiply matrices? You go like across a row of T and down a column of A. So you're going to get something times zero plus something times zero plus something times zero. So you get all uh, a zero in the first entry, a zero in the next entry in the same column. You go across some other row. All of column one is going to be zero, and all of column two is zero, and all of column whatever, except for column J, every entry in the I column of T times A is going to be all zero. What happens in column J? I don't know. doesn't matter. So that means that T times A lands in LJ. Or said another way, T times LJ is a subset of LJ for all T in MNR. So that means that LJ is a left ideal of MNR. And the key thing about this example is, OK, we know that MNR has a bunch of two-sided ideals that come from taking ideals J inside of R. This LJ is not a right ideal of R. So it's an example of a left ideal that's not a right ideal. Well, it's still an additive subgroup. But the reason it's not a right ideal is that it's not closed under right multiplication by elements of M and R. So just to take a really explicit example, zeros in every call, like let's take a choice of A and a choice of T and show that A times T is not back in LJ. Let's pick A to have zeros in all the columns except column J uh, and have one one in the first two entries and then zeros in all the other entries of this column. And let's pick our matrix T to be the all ones matrix. So what I claim is that uh, A times T has a non-zero uh, entry in both the first column and the second column. Like, just look at what happens uh, when you take the first row, the upper left entry of this product is you go across this row. At some point, you go down this column, you hit a 1. So then in the first row next, uh, next um, uh, column, you have you go across this row, you go down the second column, which is still all ones, you get a single one, so you have a one there too. So right away when you start writing down entries of this matrix, you'll see that you have non-zero entries in columns one and columns two. Column two. So what's true about LJ is you can only have non-zero entries in one column. So this shows that uh, LJ is not a right ideal. OK. You can use exactly the same idea where you switch the roles of the columns and the rows to come up with something that's a right ideal that's not a left ideal. So this is a good example to know. It's one of those things that comes up from time to time on algebra exams. Give an example of a ring and something in that ring that's a left ideal but not a right ideal.